They're the visitors we most dread. Public enemy number one. We've created the ideal environment for cockroaches to breed in. We found a cockroach. Don't panic. Don't panic. Don't panic. But for scientists, cockroaches are a remarkable source of ideas, and they've inspired some surprising inventions. They can do a lot of things that you want a robot to do. So cockroaches are a really good choice. Researchers welcome the insects into their labs and study their amazing abilities. So have the rest of us been wrong about roaches all this time? As the city goes to sleep, cockroaches start waking up. They prepare to invade. This female roach is about to lay. On the tip of her abdomen is a capsule full of eggs. It's a ticking cockroach time bomb. The capsule can be stashed in a packing case or hidden in a book. Undetected, it'll be transported to a new territory. Within a few weeks, between 16 and 64 young cockroaches will emerge. And whatever we throw at them, roaches keep coming back. They're so hard to destroy, we start to imagine things. It's said that cockroaches would be the only creatures to survive a nuclear war. That they could even withstand being cooked in a microwave oven. It is believed that they will crawl inside the noses of sleeping babies and feed. And the gleaming black bug that had no eyes. Roaches are so loathsome to us, they've even spawned a number of horror movies. Ready to grasp you in its soul chilling grip of terror, to push you beyond human endurance. Are roaches really so evil and so tough to kill? When the bug comes to your house. In fact, they wouldn't survive either a nuclear explosion or toasting in a microwave better than any other insect. But it's true that their resistance to radiation is 15 times that of man's. They are not indestructible, but they are amazingly resilient. They can eat almost anything from crumbs to the droppings of other roaches. They will even eat paper and cardboard. If there should be a real food shortage, they will simply eat each other. But they can also go for long periods without food. If a cockroach loses its head, its body can go on living for several weeks. Equipped with these practical skills, cockroach species have managed to survive on Earth for a very long time. This roach, trapped in amber, is 40 million years old. It's been stuck inside the resin since the tertiary period. And in fact, this roach is entirely modern, similar to today's roaches. It just got trapped in resin oozing out of a tree trunk. The Museum of Natural History in Paris houses fossils of the giant prehistoric mammals long since disappeared, and fossils of roaches very much still with us. Roaches have more or less the same shape now as they did 300 million years ago, but they have spread out to form a large and varied family. Here we have a sample showing the great diversity of cockroaches, around 40 species coming from all the world's tropical zones, from forest to savanna and desert, with quite a range of shapes and ways of life, species that live in colonies, species that take care of their young, even species that are solitary, unlike the pest species. Many tropical roaches are bright and colorful. Some can reach an impressive size, 
The giant cockroach of Madagascar measures eight centimeters long. They can be attentive parents, feeding and protecting their young. In all, scientists have recorded more than 3,500 different species of roach. Some tropical cockroach species chose to live alongside people and to live off them. These roaches followed humans wherever they traveled and so spread across the world. The urban environment has become their natural habitat. And the hidden world beneath our city streets is cockroach heaven. Sewers provide them with warmth, moisture, darkness, and all the food they can eat. Here they thrive and reproduce. Though they are reputed to spread disease, cockroaches are in fact very careful about their own hygiene. All the same, if they walk on our food after walking in our sewers, they will inevitably contaminate it. If cockroaches were content to stay down in the sewers, we wouldn't mind them so much. But they're always ready to explore Cracks, pipes, and wiring conduits make easy routes into our homes. No one is safe from attack. And if you should wake to discover roaches raiding your kitchen, you'll probably want to strike back and strike fast. But stop and think before you deliver the fatal blow. What if you were actually about to destroy a valuable asset? For scientists, the cockroach is anything but a mere nuisance to be exterminated. For some, it has attained celebrity status. Cockroach is now conquering new territories, poised to invade the world of research. Its athletic body fascinates biologists. It is inspiring the design of the robots of tomorrow. And it's even been chosen as the lead character in experiments using robots to manipulate living creatures. The cockroach has all the qualities you could wish for in a laboratory animal. It's cheap and requires little care. So roaches have been welcomed into the labs where they're bred, fed, and protected. The cockroach's scientific career began when researchers noticed its extraordinary ability to run away. Those who have already encountered cockroaches know how difficult it is to crush them. Before your foot has even touched the floor, the cockroach is already well on its way to safety. If you try to step on a cockroach, the wind that is developed by your foot is detected by hairs that are on appendages called cerxi that are on the, the back of the animal. The cerxi are like an extra pair of antennae that tell the cockroach what's going on behind it. At the slightest movement in the air, their hypersensitive hairs generate a nerve impulse. The cockroach is able to determine not only that there was a, a threatening wind, but also where it's coming from. And we worked out where that information goes in the, the thoracic ganglia. 
and so it, they connect up to interneurons that sort this out and then ultimately direct leg movements to make the animal turn in such a way that it would move away from the, the, the wind and so that it could then run very fast. And it happens in a, in a, in a very short uh, period of time. As well as its brain, the cockroach has three large nerve centers, or ganglia. These act like secondary brains and direct its leg movements. When the Circe detect the presence of danger, these ganglia relay the message directly to the roach's legs, bypassing the brain. The roach can react instantly. From the, the time the, the wind is turned on to the time it starts moving is about 50 milliseconds. The roach is one of the fastest animals in the world. It can cover 50 times its own body length in one second, the equivalent of a human running at 300 kilometers an hour. Roy Ritzman has spent over 30 years working with cockroaches. He heads a laboratory at the University of Cleveland, which devotes most of its research work to them. Since discovering the secret of their escape reflex, Ritzman and his team have been trying to understand how cockroaches manage such remarkable speeds. For their research, they breed large tropical cockroaches. The experiments always begin the same way, anesthetizing the insects with carbon dioxide. So we will mark the points on the end segments of the leg so that we can determine where the joints are as the animal is moving. As it's an insect, the cockroach has one particularly useful anatomical feature. Cockroaches have an exoskeleton, so their skeleton is outside the animal. So you don't have to use x-rays to look at what the skeleton's doing. And, and you can very easily see what the uh, skeletal structure is doing just looking at it from the outside. The scientists trained their subjects to run on a specially designed cockroach treadmill. This way the roaches could go on running without getting lost. That's pretty good right there. Yeah. You yeah. just leave it there and just move. Right. Like Using this system, the scientists can observe the insect from below and from the side. Its leg movements are so fast they can't be studied with the naked eye. A high-speed camera capable of recording 500 frames per second films the experiment. Played back in slow motion, the videos make it possible to break down the movements of each leg and to construct a three-dimensional model of how the cockroach runs. The front and hind legs on one side lift and fall in conjunction with the middle leg on the other side. So the cockroach always has three feet in contact with the ground. This gives maximum stability. And the cockroach can clear obstacles several times its own height while still maintaining top speed. Here, the pictures have been slowed down by a factor of 10. Its body is equipped to perform all sorts of acrobatic feats. They've got pads that allow it to stick to flat surfaces, and they've got claws that can engage into things like netting and tree bark or styrofoam or something like that. So they can attach to uh, walls. Um, they can move the leg in virtually any direction, uh, even if they're up against a wall or something like that. They've got a tremendous number of sensors, very complex muscles. The muscles themselves are fantastic actuators that we have nothing like in the technical world. 
For a cockroach, therefore, slipping through piles of rubble presents no difficulties at all. In the aftermath of an earthquake, this kind of skill would be invaluable. In order to design robots which could assist in search and rescue missions, engineers started looking to the roach for inspiration. They can do a lot of things that you want a robot to do. So cockroaches are a really good choice. So if you can develop a robot that has just some subset of the capabilities of a cockroach, then you're going to be doing really well. So engineers from the biorobotics lab at the University of Cleveland used Ritzman's research to create a robot. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. It's a kind of aluminium cockroach, 50 centimeters high, powered by compressed gas and controlled by computer. This is a research model used to test aspects of the engineering. It clearly demonstrates that technology has a long way to go before it catches up with nature. The first things you want to do is get the uh, locomotion capabilities uh, from the animal into the robot. To do that, you need good leg designs. So what we did was we looked at cockroach legs. We looked very carefully just, just how cockroach legs work. It turns out they're, uh, my initial idea that insects were simple was thrown right out the window at that point. The cockroach's foot is made up of a dozen articulated segments. Very tricky for the engineers to copy. They had to make a few compromises to come up with mechanical feet as mobile as those of the roach. The front legs of the robot are the most complicated. It has five joints, and we need to have five joints in order to obtain the range of motion necessary for all the behaviors that the front leg does. Here we have one of the artificial pneumatic muscles that drive the joints of the robot. We use these artificial muscles instead of air cylinders because they have properties that are much more similar to biological muscle. In particular, their spring-like properties. The robot cockroach weighs more than 15 kilos. 70 artificial muscles are used to move its feet, while dozens of sensors analyze the position of its joints. The software required to control its slightest movements is very complex. And the robot is hitched to so many cables and tubes, it'll never be able to move outside the lab. For the time being, this type of robot isn't going to help us out much. Which definitely can pull out. There's an air leak, though. Our goal is not to make a tiny cockroach at this point. Yes, it would be a, be a good goal in the future once we have the technology. But uh, at this time, we're interested in, in how do they work? How do they move so well in their environments? In order to conceive a more immediately useful type of robot, the engineers decided to try a different approach. So this is uh, Miniwags. Miniwags doesn't look like a, a lot like a cockroach, but actually uh, a lot of the design principles came from the cockroach. Light, solid, and extremely efficient, the Miniwags were based on a simple idea, reproducing just the fundamental elements of cockroach locomotion. What you have here is uh, what we call a wheel leg. So you can see there's, uh, there are three uh, legs put together on a hub, so it spins like a wheel, but it has a climbability of a leg. So when a leg actually gets, an, gets a hold of something like, like that, it can climb over. The simple wheel leg idea gives you the rolling ability of a, of a wheel, yet the climbability of a leg. Mini wags can run quickly over all types of terrain and can even run just as well upside down. The basic wags can be adapted to different situations, jumping over obstacles or climbing walls with the aid of adhesive feet. The cockroach's body is flexible. When climbing obstacles, the animal bends in order to balance its weight.
If it's forced to keep its body straight, it's much more difficult for the roach to maintain its balance. The engineers decided to give their robots the same flexibility. So what we did was uh, we went ahead and put in this body joint. So now instead of lifting the whole body, it just lifts the front. So it aids climbing taller obstacles, but also it aids getting over those obstacles once we've actually started to surmount them. This research got results. The new cockroach robots could keep going even over rough terrain. In 2001, following the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, rescue workers used robots to hunt for survivors. These robots were remote controlled and ran on caterpillar tracks. Their success was limited. The robots weren't sufficiently mobile and most importantly, they lacked the autonomy and intelligence needed to find their own way through the wreckage. If you're relying on the robot to tell you when it's going to come up to a problem like a shelf or a block or something like that, by the time the robot detects something and the person driving it realizes what's happening and reacts, the robot will potentially be stuck. And that's what happened when they sent them into the World Trade Center. What you want to do is what animals do very well be able to detect things on, on, its, on its own, make decisions, and change the way that it's walking. So the next step was to give the robots this kind of autonomy. Once more, the scientists turned to the cockroach. But this time, the research subject was put through a rather more grueling experience. The goal was to understand how the roach's nervous system controls its movements, how information is relayed from the sense organs and turned into actions. The regions that we put these wires into, we believe are important for the transmission of the sensory information from the antennae, from the eyes, through the central nervous system and into the motor regions of the animal which control the leg movements. Electrodes are implanted in the roach's brain or muscles and it is placed on an oiled plate. The electrodes record the insect's neurological activity as it runs. These experiments make it possible to pinpoint areas in the brain that control certain actions. Alternatively, we can actually inject current through these wires and stimulate into those brain regions and see if we're able to influence the behavior. When the animal is not stimulated, it's walking in a standard tripod gait. If you observe this black square, when that goes on, the animal has been stimulated in the wires in the left side of the brain. And now what happens is that middle leg on the left indicates that the animal is in a turn. You can see it stretching out and pulling as opposed to going straight back and forth when the animal was walking naturally. Clearly, the brain plays a very active role in the insect's ability to deal with obstacles. A cockroach is placed in front of a ramp. Its antennae detect the slope its brain commands a change in posture, and the insect climbs without any difficulty. For the cockroach on the right, it's a different story. The area of the brain which controls its antennae has been damaged, and the antennae are out of commission. The cockroach can still walk. 
but can't adapt to the slope. The engineers designed a robot equipped with antennae which it could use in a similar way. The robot could now decide for itself how to deal with an obstacle. One would hope that one could use this sort of information to make a robotic insect head with a robotic brain. The actions with the antennae with WEGS controlling a brain circuit that controlled the body flexion joint is sort of a first step in that direction. Biologists and engineers have together created efficient mobile robots, which will soon be ready for use in the field. However, the robots have a long way to go before they can match the natural abilities of the cockroach. The funny thing is, 15 years ago, I thought that uh, insects were fairly simple creatures. Uh, that it wouldn't be very difficult to uh, make a robot that was better than an insect. And, and now I've learned respect for nature. The cockroach's usefulness as a laboratory animal is now universally recognized. But sadly for the roach, success has its downside. The roach's worst enemies, insecticide manufacturers, also consider it an excellent test subject. In fact, the cockroach is always first in line when it comes to trying out a new product. If an insecticide can kill a roach, then it can kill any bug. Here, the scientists breed cockroaches by the thousands, just to watch them die. For these unfortunate research subjects, the chips are down. No one here gets out alive. After the one hour, we remove the insects and we'll determine what uh, effect the insecticides have on these cockroaches at regular intervals. Uh, and that way we can compare which uh, of these compounds are the most effective against the insects. This is another big advantage of using cockroaches for research. No one ever protests about cruelty to roaches. Insecticides work on insects' nervous systems, causing paralysis and then death. The tiny brain of the cockroach is its control center, so it's here that the scientists experiment with their poisons. They take individual nerve cells from the roach's brain and see how their products work at the most minute cellular level. Yeah, the cockroach is a good model for studying the action of insecticides on the nervous system. For one thing, because there's a lot of uh, information about the cockroach nervous system, both the organization of the nervous system and also the receptors, uh, which are the target sites of the insecticides. A tiny electrode is inserted in a brain cell placed on a glass slide. It records changes in neurological activity as the insecticide is added. The scientists can then measure how long it takes the insecticides to work on the nervous system. They can also perfect their products so that they won't prove dangerous to humans or their pets. Most of the commonly used insecticides work on the nervous system and can be made specific for, for insects because there are enough differences between the nervous systems of insects and other animals. Of course, roaches are not only a test subject for these products, they're also a prime target. 1% of the cockroaches known to man are considered to be important as pests. And this is because they have an omnivorous habit. They feed on a wide range of different foodstuffs, many of which are similar to what uh, humans eat. It's pretty easy to see that uh, through evolution, the cockroach moved into the habitat of the human and evolved alongside. Nowadays that we live in urban environments, we've created the ideal environment for cockroaches to breed in. They like the warmth and the climate um, that the humans also like to have. Nigel Arms directs the research division of a leading industrial insecticide company. His laboratory actually breeds some of the most invasive cockroach species on Earth. They are kept under tight security. So this is the, the German cockroach. 
which worldwide is probably the most important species. This box was set up about two months ago with uh, 50 individuals we put into this box. And uh, as you can see now, there's probably maybe 10 to 20,000 individuals here. This is the American cockroach, which is probably number two on the list of uh, nasties for the pest control operator. Um, and although it uh, has the name American, it didn't actually derive its origins from America. It's believed to have come from tropical Africa um, and was actually transported around the world, um, particularly in the 17th and 18th century on ships. There was, uh, at that time, very heavy traffic between Africa, the Americas, and the Caribbean, which took these species around the world. Okay, and here comes number three. This is um, the oriental cockroach, which is the third most important pest species. Again, its name doesn't necessarily indicate where it originated. The oriental cockroach is also a cosmopolitan species. It is found globally, but is um, particularly prevalent in Europe, southern Europe, Mediterranean areas. This is a very common species. Cockroaches require minimal attention. We basically feed them with uh, dried cat food and just give them a water source, and then just leave them on their own, leave them in the dark, and uh, they're quite happy. By comparison, human habitations are downright luxury for roaches. To deter them from moving in, it's as well to follow some basic guidelines. You found a cockroach. Don't panic, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. The best way to avoid cockroaches infesting your house, rule number one, remove the things they like. That's food, that's water, and a place to hide. <laughs> Store all food in sealed bags or containers, even the pet food. Do not leave any organic matter for the cockroaches. And this is important because cockroaches will eat practically anything. Make sure the garbage can is clean and keep all waste food safely stored. Whilst cockroaches can live for quite a long time without food, water is absolutely essential for their survival. So in buildings and apartments, after the kitchen, cockroaches will often head straight for the bathroom. Not only must you ensure that they have no access to running water, you must also ensure that gaps between pipes are sealed, as these provide the highways for cockroaches to break into your house. Roaches are stealthy and only come out at night. By the time you first spot a raider, the colony will already be firmly established. Then there's only one solution. Call in the SWAT team. Cockroach extermination is big business, carried out by highly trained killers, armed with the latest in modern weaponry. Today, the team's being called to clean up an empty apartment. There's no way it can be let while roaches still hold the field. The aim is total annihilation. If only one female or one single egg case escapes, a second wave of cockroach invaders will soon appear. There she is. Yep, that's a German cockroach. Just the one right now, but it doesn't take long to it'll be a lot more. In, in a year, you can have thousands of roaches just from you know, two roaches. Said so all the egg cases look like they've hatched out, and there's usually about 30 roaches per case. So you can imagine how many was in here at one time. The exterminators deploy their weapons of mass destruction. So I put a little bit, just, just a touch of it, 
right there. It's about all you need. And that's enough right there for that whole area. Poisoned bait is one of the most lethal items in the armory. Probably the Achilles heel of the cockroach is that they need to feed. Um, cockroaches are, are voracious feeders. They're omnivorous. They feed on a wide range of different foodstuffs. You can usually effectively control a cockroach if you can put uh, an insecticide into a, a bait ingredient. So how do you design the ultimate roach bait? When we're developing baits for cockroaches, it's important that the baits are both attractive and palatable, meaning that the cockroaches will initially go to them and that they'll feed on them. The roaches that have survived the intensive use of poison baits are the ones who quite simply didn't like the taste of the baits in the first place. Their descendants share these aversions. The result is that there are now many roaches that dislike sugary tastes, for example. The challenge for bait designers is constantly to create new substances that attract roaches. In this test, we've placed a piece of paper that actually has the attractant extract on it. The extract goes into this tube right here so that the airflow comes over top of it into the port right here and then into the center arena where the cockroach is going to enter. The cockroach will then travel up from the entrance container into the main arena and can make a decision whether or not to go into these two ports or to the two ports that have nothing. The substances that roaches choose are the ones used against them in baits. One of the things about roaches is that they feed readily upon all sorts of different things, like crumbs that are left in someone's house. So it's important when you're developing a bait that the bait is more attractive than whatever food may be available to them. And what is most attractive to a roach? Well, it seems it's other roaches. At the University of Rennes, Colette Rivaux is studying the role smell plays in their social life. This experiment demonstrates that roaches really like to stick together. The tube on the right sends out the odor of other roaches, and the tube on the left sends out the smell of fresh air. So we'll see what choice it makes, and how long it will stay in one tube or the other. So now I'm putting a male into the olfactometer to test what his reactions will be towards the two odors on offer. Rivaux's not just interested in what attracts roaches, she's also fascinated by how they are attracted. Their antennae hold the key. These are not only responsible for navigating obstacles in the roach's path, but also for sense of smell. Made up of over 150 articulated segments, roach antennae are covered with millions of highly sensitive scent receptors. They play a central role in roach communication using pheromones. Pheromones are molecules cockroaches release to communicate with other roaches. They are smells, molecules released into the environment, the surrounding air, to send messages. So pheromones are used a bit like a language. Cockroaches use pheromones in order to find each other and group together, to find a mate or to warn each other of danger. The fact that they give off all these smells is one of the reasons we find them so disgusting. But for the roaches, this chemical communication is vital. It is the glue that holds cockroach society together. Cockroaches haven't reached the same degree of organization as true social insects. In particular, all cockroaches can reproduce, which of course is not the case with ants or bees, where only a few individuals produce all the young. But roaches are nonetheless considered as having social behavior, as they're capable of exchanging information between individuals, which allows them to group together and make the best use of their environment. Cockroach colonies make collective decisions about where to live or when it's time to migrate to a new refuge. 
Each individual participates in the group's decisions without even really being aware of it. These collective decision-making processes are particularly intriguing for scientists who wish to analyze how animal societies work. To do this, Belgian researchers have set up Project Decoy, which uses robots to influence and manipulate cockroach society. A cockroach's capabilities are far superior to all our present-day technology. We've constructed a robot that can reproduce some aspects of the cockroach's behavior, but using a technology radically different from biology, because trying to make an artificial roach seems completely unrealistic. The insect robots, called InSpots for short, are completely autonomous. They communicate with each other using infrared signals and have tiny sensors, which enable them to distinguish between cockroaches and other obstacles. But the InSpots had to be taught to behave like cockroaches, and this meant analyzing in detail just how a cockroach colony functions. The scientists placed a roach colony in an experimental enclosure. Using a computer program, they were then able to track the movements of each individual insect. These observations allowed them to translate cockroach behavior into a mathematical equation that described the way the roaches moved about and interacted. The cockroach formula was then used to program the inspots. The problem is that since the robot is not a roach, we have to trick the roach into perceiving the robot as one of the group, another member of the colony. Of course, the inspot doesn't look a bit like a cockroach, but this doesn't necessarily matter. For cockroaches, physical appearance is much less important than smell. To disguise their robot, the Project Decoy researchers called on Colette Rivaux. Rivaux had succeeded in extracting the pheromone that makes it possible for roaches to gather together and to recognize members of their own colony. It's a kind of chemical password. The Project Decoy researchers camouflaged their inspots using this magic potion. Now, if the inspots behave correctly, the roaches should consider them as members of the group. If the robots are able to reproduce the roach behavior entirely, or even partially, then we'll put them in with the cockroaches, with the idea that robots and roaches will make the same kind of choices. The encounter between robots and roaches takes place in an experimental enclosure containing two colored filters. The cockroaches cannot see red light, so under these filters they believe that they're in the shade. This allows the researchers to create a comfort zone for the roaches, while at the same time being able to watch what's going on. The cockroaches feel the robots with their antennae, a sign that they like their smell and that the camouflage is a success. If the inspots have been correctly programmed, and if the cockroaches accept them as part of the group, the robots should join the cockroaches under the shelters. And this is just what happens. The inspots have succeeded in passing themselves off as roaches. The robots influence the insects, the insects influence the robots. And what's new is that we've created an artificial system, in this case a robot, which is capable of influencing the animals, but also of adapting itself to their behavior. Not content with merely infiltrating the colony, the InSpots have gone one step further. They've managed to take control. Robots programmed to prefer light managed to draw the colony toward a lighter area against the insect's natural instinct to stay in the dark.
If the robots are capable of influencing cockroaches, perhaps it may someday be possible to use InSpots to draw them away from our homes. That's probably an impossible dream, but Project Decoy's research has shed new light on herding behavior. It might, for example, lead to new techniques for controlling flocks. Just as the InSpots influence cockroaches, artificial sheep might be able to influence the collective decision-making process which leads a flock in one direction or another. These artificial sheep would not be machines resembling real sheep, but decoys reproducing some basic types of behavior, like bleating. They could persuade the flock to stay within a specific area. Fences would no longer be needed. So, cockroach-inspired robots could one day help control animals, making the roach truly a super cockroach. In the meantime, artist Garnet Hertz has reversed these roles and has given roaches the chance to control robots. Thanks to him, the insects are now getting their own wheels. Completely untrained insects. I don't know if he could even train them. <laughs> So as the cockroach runs on the ball, it makes the robot move. If the cockroach turns to the right, the robot moves to the right. And if the cockroach turns to the left, the robot moves to the left. When the robot approaches an obstacle, diodes blink, warning the driver. If the obstacle is to the right, the diodes on the right light up. The cockroach will naturally turn away from the light, and so swerves to the left. So much for the theory. In practice, their driving is somewhat erratic. Each one drives the robot differently. Some drive it very, very fast. Some go slow and long. Some run fast and stop. Some crash into things. And so each has a very different character. Each cockroach has its own personality. So in order to keep track of that, I give them names. Julie, Pedro, and company are now recognized works of contemporary art. But for some people, none of this is new. They've long been convinced of the exceptional talents of roaches. Look, look at that. That's the beauty of biology. The roach is able to climb up a nylon thread. The day that robots can do that, We're never going to want cockroaches in our homes. But now we know they have many hidden qualities, even beauty. When a young roach sheds its skin to allow a new one to grow, it emerges as the purest white, its wings as delicate and fine as a dragonfly's. It seems the reviled cockroach is a creature of many layers, a miraculous combination of elite engineering, social cohesion, and evolutionary success. It is truly a super cockroach. <laughs>